I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 1, as we come through a famous story of the angel coming to greet Mary. And uh, we, this Advent, we have been going through the Christological controversies, which sounds like a, a, a lecture series or something like that. But they're, they're the early church's struggle to f- try to figure out exactly how we should say that Jesus has come, or the Son of God has come in Jesus uh, as our, our Lord. And so these controversies sprung up. And of course, with uh, misinformation from movies like uh, uh, The Da Vinci Code and whatnot, you have this idea that, that somehow the church uh, thought up the idea of the incarnation uh, hundreds of years later, which is absolutely historically incorrect. Uh, from the very beginning, God's people have been holding to the truth of the incarnation. It's just how do we state it? And so one of the, the, the Christological controversies we looked at was docetism, which is from the Greek word to seem or to appear. And that the idea is that 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 Jesus really, the Son of God, appeared to be a man. He, he looked like a man, talked like a man, but he really was uh, fully God. And uh, that that of course comes from the idea of that somehow earth and matter and whatnot are are. Uh, evil things or, or subpar. And, uh, and of course the church said, no, no, that's not what we believe. Uh, as one of the fathers said, uh, what is not assumed cannot be healed. If he doesn't assume our humanity, then he can't heal us. Uh, the word did become flesh. And then we looked at Arianism as well, which is named not after a Greek word, but after a pastor from Egypt, who Arius, who said just the very opposite of Docetism. He said, denied the deity of Christ and said Jesus is a sort of divine, but he's not as divine as God the Father. He's similar in substance, but not the same. And he had the famous quote, there was a time in eternity when the Son of God was not. In other words, that, that somehow God created uh, the Son of God and then he became uh, one of us. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses believe that still today, and so Arianism is, is alive and well, well. And it made a big splash in the fourth century, uh, but it, uh, it certainly fell short of what the scriptures said. And then, then uh, we, uh, the Council of, of, of 381, Council of Constantine, uh, uh, Constantinople rather, uh, met and, and established, certainly we believe, in fully God, fully man. But then the debate continued on, continued on with how does that fit? How, how is he God and fully God and fully man? How, how does he have two natures and how do they coexist? How do they interact? And so several um, different Christological heresies came up of Apollinarism, uh, uh, named after Apollinaris, uh, Bishop of Laodicea in the fourth century, who basically said that, yeah, yeah he was God and man, but, uh, but the God part filled up the mind and the will of the human side of Jesus, uh, that he was mostly human, that the uh, divine kind of dominated that will. And, and of course, the church rejected this because the Savior who is not fully human can't uh, fully represent us uh, and therefore can't save us. And then Nestorius came and he did uh, something uh, he thought was helpful but was not, and he separated the two natures of Christ. Uh, that happens often in the church. People think they're being helpful, but they're not. And, uh, and uh, there's two natures in the, there, and he separated them so far that it sounded like Jesus was two persons, two he's, two, two different of uh, Christ, and the church rejected that in three, uh, 431 at the Council of Ephesus. And then third, finally, was uh, uh, Tys- uh, Eutyches, who, who did just the opposite of the story, who blended the two natures to such uh, an extent that really you lost the, the two natures distinction at all, uh, uh, at all. So anyway, then uh, this prompted the Council of uh, Chalcedon in 451 and, and the form that it stayed with the church for these hundreds and hundreds of years is that Christ is two natures in one, one person. Uh, Chalcedon said it well, uh, uh, a quote from the creed that came out of that council, Christ uh, is perfect in Godhead, perfect in manhood, truly God, truly man. Uh, uh, he's to be acknowledged in two persons, the property of each nature being preserved. In other words, they both are, his human nature doesn't make his divine nature any less divine or, or vice versa. 
and then went on to say the property of each nature being preserved, concurring in one person. And we focused on that last week, that Christ is one person and uh, not two persons. And so th this today, and this final week of Advent, uh, I want to uh, go back uh, word in history to uh, a Christological controversy that I didn't think we would have time for, but I'm glad we do, and which is called Ebionism, E-B-I-O, uh, E-B-I-O-N, yes. Uh, and it's, uh, I'll tell you about what, where that name comes from, but it was a, kind of the original heresy of the church. You can read about it, and much of the New Testament even is responding to forms of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, there. So let's read the story, though, of, of Mary and the coming of our Lord uh, from Luke chapter uh, 1, beginning at verse 26. This is the word of the living God. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings. You who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, his kingdom will never end. How can this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to you, me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would help us now. You strengthen us as we need to hear your word. We need strength all along our lives and every day of our lives, but we need strength also to hear your word, to not be distracted, not to misuse this time, uh, not to be deceived or thought, uh, think of other things. Lord, help us now to think of you and your word and what it must have been like for Mary to hear these words and what we need to know about uh, yourself. Lord, help us as we and I'll conclude this, that we would not miss the true and living Christ. And uh, we ask that you would help us in that regard. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but my favorite superhero is Batman. Batman. Uh, I, from a 10-year-old, I was enthralled by, on Wednesday nights, with Adam West's version of Batman and Pow and all that stuff that came together. And it was, if you know, it was on two nights in a row on the week. So you had, I think it was Wednesday night, and then you had it again on Thursday night. So it was kind of a part one, and you would have to stay tuned for the same bat time and the bat, same bat channel. You remember that? And you might be wondering right now, why, why am I talking about Batman on the fourth Sunday of Advent? <laughs> um, well, you might remember that three weeks ago I talked to you about a book by the name of Todd uh, Miles on superheroes can't save you. And what this guy does is a wonderful thing. He takes superheroes and parallels them with uh, Christological controversy. So it fit very well with what I wanted to do. And we looked at how that was true of docetism, the one this seems to be a man. Uh, Superman was the best parallel to that because he seems to be Clark Kent, but he's not really Clark Kent. He's someone else from another planet with great power. And this fellow, Todd, Todd Miles, goes on to say, and I'll read you just a paragraph of it. Uh, let's face it, when it comes to superhero credentials, Batman does not bring much to the table. He has no superpowers. He cannot uh, breathe underwater like Aquaman. He can, uh, cannot uh, turn into uh, anything or anybody. He is not uh, from another planet. Superman can fly faster than a speeding bullet. Batman has to run to his car and always takes time to put on his seatbelt. Uh, 
the attributes of Superman are lauded in his theme song, but while the best can be sung about Batman, it's not a da 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 Batman. You know? <laughs> and, and, and yet still, uh, who doesn't like Batman? Maybe it is because Batman's character is so well developed, uh, more than any other comic book hero. Batman is so human, we can actually relate to his a dark and tortured world. He's Bruce Wayne, really, uh, blessed with ninja fighting skills and able to marshal intimidation and fear against most of the criminals he fights. Uh, it is not as if Batman had nothing going for him. He even has a nifty utility belt loaded with all kinds of sorts of handy bat gadgets. But none of those things are superpowers. None are supernatural. There is no hint that Batman is anything other than an incredibly human being with the seemingly unlimited amounts of cash. <laughs> he, he may be the most remarkable human being in comic lore, but in the final analysis, he is just a human being. And then he goes on to say, some people feel the same about Jesus. Uh, he goes, well, let me give you a couple more sentences. To, this, to these folks, Jesus is a remarkable human being possessed with enormous charisma, wisdom, compassion, leadership qualities, and teaching ability. Jesus may be and probably is the most incredible human being that has ever lived. It is entirely likely that there has never been nor ever will be another man like Jesus. But in the final analysis, he is just a man. He is worthy of respect, not reverence or worship. He is not divine in any unique way. He is a human being. And that is all. Jesus, just a man. That's what Ebenism was. It goes back to the first century, times when the scriptures were being written. It's the ancient heresy that tried to be kind of a middle ground between Christianity and Judaism. They were Jewish believers of sorts, impressed with Jesus, Knowledge that he was a great teacher, knowledge that he was a gifted prophet, acknowledge that he was the new Moses that would start a new covenant. Even they acknowledged him as Messiah, uh, the Messiah that would come back someday in the future and reign on earth. But he was not pre existent, he was not born of a virgin for most of them, he was for all of them not God. The Son of God at his baptism was this kind of a theory that kind of came in even in the third century uh, with this adoptionism that he became, Jesus became the son of God at his baptism. The spirit came upon him, but then left before the cross uh, and uh, was the son of God in that way. And they wanted to be followers of Christ, but they followed the Christ that is not the Christ spoken about in the scriptures. And their salvation followed suit. This is what we see over and over again. Uh, their view, belief about how one is saved or made right with God is only through law keeping. It's through being a good Jew, being a good person, following the example of Jesus. And you see how that fits. As you, if your view of Christ is lower than the God man, then you will inevitably go to a view of thinking that you can save yourself or that you'll have some mixture of the Savior and yourself. When you have the right view, uh, the biblical view of Christ as the God-man, then we will understand why we need grace. Well, why were they called the Ebenites? Well, there's debate about that. Some believe they called them that themselves because the word comes from the Hebrew word for poor or poor men. And so they thought of themselves as the poor, talked about in the Old Testament, the humble and the poor that God favors. They were those who would also help the poor. Or the other theory is that they were called this by Christians in a derogatory kind of way as being such poor thinkers <laughs> or poor Christians. Um, but they died out by about the mid-fifth century. And when you think about it, most people are Ebionites of sorts today. Jesus is great. Jesus taught a lot of cool things. He was a special person. He was connected to God in a way nobody has been connected before to this God consciousness like, like never before. And therefore, we should hear him out. We should follow his lead when it makes sense and, uh, and, and, and go his way. Sort of like Batman. Sort of like Batman who hated injustice and tried his best to do something about it. 
Well, this view has actually crept into the church as well. And over the last 150, 200 years, a thing called uh, theological liberalism has creeped into churches all through the, uh, our nation, throughout the world. And people, it came sort of with, with the thinking of that people don't think in terms of the supernatural now uh, in the 19th century. They don't think in terms of blood sacrifices and absolute truths. And so we have to do something different. We have to do something. We have to do something or, or we'll lose our voice in society. We'll lose our influence. And the pastors were afraid of losing their jobs, literally. And so the church has to come up with a new message, a Jesus people can relate to, a, a Bible they can tolerate, a gospel that tells us uh, to look within ourselves and within others and find the good there. Uh, H. Richard Niebuhr su uh, kind of summarized this whole movement. It's gone through all, all the denominations and churches throughout the, the world. Uh, as a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministration of a Christ without a cross. See, it just gets rid of the cross. It gets rid of anything supernatural. It gets rid of anything like sin or wrath uh, and judgment and just kind of has this uh, inner core of uh, loving one another and trying to connect with God the best way we can. In Flannery O'Connor's wild and crazy book, um, Wise Blood, uh, uh, she has a, a preacher in a character in that book, if you've read it. It's a satire uh, on the church and on Christianity to some degree. Uh, a, a character by the name of Hazel Motes, and he says he preaches at a church without Christ where nobody sheds blood and there's no redemption because there ain't any sin to redeem, and what's dead stays that way. That's, that's theological liberalism. And it has creeped in not only through major denominations of the, of the world, but it is starting to creep into even the evangelicalism. Uh, George Barna uh, coaches evangelicals. He says this as a quote. It is critical that we keep in mind a fundamental principle of Christian communication. Here it is. The audience, not the message, is sovereign. If you go on that trajectory, your message will change because you'll please the audience. The audience is sovereign. No, God's sovereign and he's given us a message and we're to be faithful in giving that message. The gossip God, and, and liberalism will ends up in, in, in not good news from an angel coming to Mary. It ends up in just basically good advice. Do better, be better, get in touch with your God consciousness. And what a refreshing contrast this is when we come to the scriptures, to the gospels, when we come to the good news of great joy we find here in the story I just read to you. The scriptures that recall that God is breaking into our world, sending his angel Gabriel to a, a teenage girl living in a tiny little town called Nazareth. Uh, he, Kent Hughes puts it well when he says, from all indicators, Mary's life would not be extraordinary. She would marry humbly, give birth to numerous poor children, never travel further than a few miles from home, and one day, like thousands of others before her, she would die, a nobody in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. And then God breaks in. God breaks into her life. God breaks into our world. And God reveals the arrival of the son that will save, the son of God, the promised king, the, the promised kingdom. And we see that God always keeps his word. It may take hundreds of years, but he always keeps his word. And he does the miraculous. Mary, a virgin, will have a child, the Son of God. God does what has never, ever been done before. He becomes one of us in Mary's womb, in her uterus. And of course, we always take, when we should take ponder, ponder to wonder this and say, how can this be? That's exactly what she asks, right? How can this possibly be? And it's because God does it. It's because God breaks in 
God the Holy Spirit steps on the scene and creates a new person, the God-man, um, like us in all ways except for sin, and yet all that God the Son is. He takes over. Really what's being described to Mary there is that a, a new creation is formed. God overshadows her. That's a key word, overshadows. It's what he did in the tabernacle. He overshadowed the tabernacle and filled that tabernacle in the Old Testament with his presence. It's the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit going back to the very early verses of the, the scriptures where the Holy Spirit hovers over and overshadows God's creation where a new creation will come out of that and be formed in the next six days. God does what is impossible to us, what is seemingly impossible for us. The whole point of the Christmas message, uh, or at least a surrounding context point, is that this is a miraculous thing. Christianity is a miraculous and supernatural faith. We need to remember that. Sometimes we don't see miracles and, and we don't, uh, I have not experienced the miracles that we find in the scriptures, and we think that it's sort of, uh, uh, Christianity is about thinking only, and it's only about, about understanding. But it, it is a miraculous, a miraculous good news that we have. And don't let me, let me take a side. Don't, don't ever let anyone make you feel ashamed of believing in the miraculous just because you haven't seen that yet. If God uh, uh, doesn't do miracles, Miracles, there's going to be no gospel for us. It had to be a miracle. He had to become through a virgin. He had to become man for us. The gospel is all about God's miracles to draw us to himself. Those who have trouble understanding miracle are merely not they're leaving God out of the equation. When you leave God out of the equation, of course a miracle doesn't make any sense. It sounds silly. You uh, lock yourself into a, a naturalistic worldview, then miracles can't exist. Uh, what a limited worldview that really is. But there is no problem with miracles when God is God. When God is in the picture, miracles make sense. For God who created everything out of nothing can certainly change the course of what he has made. That's really what we're saying. God made it all. He formed it all out of nothing. Certainly, he can change it at particular points in the history of the world. It's only when we won't allow God into our worldview that miracles become a problem. If the world is just is, if the world is just a uh, kind of a finite machine, then miracles, of course, can't happen. There is no one to do the miracle. There's no one to change the system. But that's not the world that we live in. We live in God's world, the world of one who made it all. And so certainly he can cause the virgin to have a child. Certainly he can become one of us in the person of Jesus if he deems necessary. And he has deemed it necessary because we have lost our way, because we've turned from the God who has made us in so many different ways because we have gone our own way. And so God must intervene. God must uh, come and reunite us to himself. And that's why he became one of us, to live the life that we could never live perfectly on our behalf, to die the death we should die, to put us back together again, to give us back the life that we lost with him to make us right with him once again. And so the Batman Jesus, the liberal Jesus, the theologically liberal Jesus, the great teacher only Jesus will never do. This Jesus is actually the fairy tale that's been made up by men. The just a good man Jesus it could fascinate us, it can challenge us, he can relate to us, but he can't save us. He can't forgive us. He can't reconcile us to God. We need the Savior that God has provided, the Savior who really is one of us and yet totally, totally different from us. 
the Savior who is fully human and fully God, the Savior who can represent us and that also really pay for our sins because he offers this complete, perfect, infinite sacrifice on the cross. No other Savior will do. No other Jesus will do. The, and, but the good news is this Savior does exist. <laughs> this Savior has taken on our humanity. This Savior has taken on our case. And we belong, we belong to him if we trust him. Jesus is no mere Batman, no mere man. All the way through the scriptures, we're told that Jesus is God. It's so many different ways. If you look at it carefully, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is worshipped. Only God should be worshipped. In Mark's gospel, Jesus controls the weather. It actually listens to him. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is called the Lord 20 different times. In John's gospel, he begins it with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and then says that that word became flesh and dwelt among us. John also records Jesus saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen God, is what he's saying. Those who knew Jesus the best believed he was God. I can't get over that. How many minutes would your friends need to know before they knew that you were not God? Think about that. But they spent time with him. They saw him in difficult situations, the worst of situations, dying on a cross. And at the end, they said, yes, he was one of us. But he also was God with us. Think of Paul in Romans 9, 5 says, Christ, who is God over all, forever praised, amen. Or Colossians 1, 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Not partial fullness, not some fullness, but all his fullness. Hebrews 1, 3, the Son, S-O-N, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. And Jesus' half-brother James says in his uh, epistle, Chapter 2, verse 1, my brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Think of a brother calling another brother such a high title. Brothers are hard on each other. James knew that his brother was the God-man. Or one last example, think of Revelation chapter 5, when um, in heaven the Lamb is exalted and, and, and there's, there's, there's heaven singing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and, and honor and glory and praise. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. We're told in the scriptures that God does not share his glory with another. And yet we find if Jesus, the lamb, is another, God doing that very thing here. No. God the Father and God the Son, the lamb, are honored together because they are one God. One God. This is the Jesus of the scriptures. This is the only Jesus that truly exists who's come for sinners like you and me. The only question remains is, will you trust him? You and I know much more, even in this sermon, you know more than Mary knew about Jesus. And yet she responded in humble acceptance, in trusting faith. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said, in other words, I'm all in here. I'm yours, Lord. Body and soul and life and in death, I belong not to myself, but my faithful Savior. That's what she was saying from the Heidelberg Catechism. It hadn't been written yet, but it's the same thing. That's what she's saying. Mary was no silly little girl believing in fairy tales. But she really was the first Christian, the first follower, the first disciple of Christ who sunk her faith into this Savior. She believed God's word to her. Will you? She held on to God's promise. Will you? She looked 
in faith to Christ. Will you? Let's close in a word and a prayer together. Father, we ask that you would help us now that we would continue to make the decision to follow you or perhaps make that decision for the first time to believe in you and to trust that you are the God-man. It's silly to believe that you were just a teacher because if you were a good teacher, you wouldn't have taught the things you taught. You wouldn't have said that you were the, if you see me, you've seen the Father. You wouldn't claim to be God. You wouldn't be a good teacher. That, that Lord, we know is not open to us. That's not the, that's a dead end street, Lord. May we come to that open door and come to you and trust in you with all, with all our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to the table. We're going to take the, the Lord's Supper a little differently this morning. You're going to be asked to come forward. Um, and there'll be a station here at the end of each of the uh, three aisles. This is the place in which we come and we remember what we just heard. We take of the bread and the cup, remembering his body given for us, his blood shed for us. It's a time where he says he will commune with us and, we'll, and we actually participate in him. There's a, there's a special connection that happens when we, by faith, uh, take this bread and cup. The change doesn't happen in the elements. The change happens in us and in his power to reach us through his spirit. So this is the table of the Lord for God's people, for all God's people, for sinners that are God's people that need a savior and have a savior in Jesus Christ. If, if that's not what you believe yet, or if you're just still considering that, uh, please let the bread and the cup pass. Uh, don't come forward in this case. Uh, but think and pray, even pray, and ask the Lord to open your heart. Many people have prayed uh, a prayer of just simply saying, Lord, if you're really there, if this is really the true gospel, then make that real to me. Make that, open my heart to that. We'll answer those kinds of prayers. Uh, take time to do that and find the Savior today. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you would help us as we come to the table now. That we would come to it rightly, knowing we're sinners and yet, and don't come perfectly ever. But we do come as your faithful disciples who say, Lord, I'm your servant. Do unto me whatever you will. We belong to you in body and soul, in life and in death. So Lord, help us now as we commune you with you that know that you will never leave us, forsake us, double cross us or trick us. You love us with an everlasting love. And so Lord, may that love be uh, seen in the table and in the elements as we receive them, as we come up actually in faith uh, to receive you and all that you offer us in the gospel. And we ask these things and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.